Thank you, Brother Orrin. I trust that you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and King, and that you're not ashamed to proclaim him. He told Pilate, when Paul says he witnessed the good confession, he told him that he is the great King. And I want to come back now to the end of chapter 7 of the book of Acts. We want to wrap up this message of Stephen, the first martyr of the church. And these last few verses in verses 44 to 60, I'm breaking down this way. I'm thinking of three things that I want to emphasize. First, God's greatness. That's one of the things that Stephen was accused of taking away from the glory of God. And, and I trust as you read the message, you see he magnifies God. And we'll see that here in a minute. Secondly, and I'm calling it a lament. And, and it's a lament that still goes on. We lament the human resistance to the truth. I mean, it's just staggering. And that's what we see here, of course. And then thirdly, hope. Some will enter glory. Some will enter glory. Based on how they respond to the gospel, of course. So Stephen is not only defending himself against four charges that were brought up, serious charges, charges that would have required stoning because of blasphemy. He answers them in this message. But I want us to think about the ways of God, because that's part of what Stephen has done. He's gone back and rehearsed the whole history of God's dealings with humankind, especially with the nation of Israel, because he's addressing Israeli people, number one. And number two, he's showing God's plan of redemption. And that demonstrates the faithfulness and love of God and the power of God. God has a plan to save. Always has had that plan. Before creation even existed, which is something all of us can't get our minds around. We have limitations there. But we accept it as truth because the Word of God teaches it. I want to come back before we look here in, in Acts 7 again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 because that's part of what Paul is dealing with here. And don't forget, Paul was within earshot at least, if not part of the audience of this message that Stephen gives. In fact, as I study more and more of it, I begin to think that Paul, the apostle, is version two of Stephen. Stephen had such an impact on Paul, and I'll show you that in a minute later on the message. But Paul says that in verse six of chapter two, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. Not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to what? See, the rulers of this age, with their human reasoning, worldly wisdom, they think that without God and without Jesus Christ, without the Bible, without the church, they can bring nirvana, they can bring utopia, and they are working on that, believe me. In the UN, in the EU, in the big governmental powerhouse that they're happening in all these different conferences, they have a plan. Now, there's been an interruption in that plan with the November 2016 election. And I'm, I must say, without getting to anything political, I'm thankful there's been an interruption in that plan. This whole one world government globalism, which the Bible tells us we know that's what's going to happen in the tribulation, but we didn't know maybe we were that close to the tribulation. We know there's going to be one world religion and there's been tremendous advances on that just in the last 10 years, let alone since World War II. But definitely the things of World War II, all of this strategy is really mapping out. With a plan, we're finding out that they all talk to each other. They all have a plan, but God has a plan. And the rulers of this age 
will never find God by their human wisdom. They'll never find God that way. Now to me, that's genius on God's part. I praise him for that. Before I was saved, I was proud of my intellect and proud of my education and proud of my worldly religion. And, and the gospel just went right over my head. Why? Because it was too simple. Because it didn't make sense that dying on the cross and forgiveness could be linked together. I mean, I understood the cross. I, I probably wore a crucifix sometime in my youth. And of course, we did the rosary and all of those things. And it had a crucifix on it. But I never came to know God and I never came to know truth in deliverance that way. In fact, it became a huge obstacle to my salvation. My salvation should have taken a lot shorter time than it did. Someone might argue, what took so long? Well, a thick skull <laughs> and a lot of false input. After I was saved, some few months after I was saved, my mother gave me a call. They were checking in, and Mom and I had a relationship where I teased her a lot, and she gave me a lot of room on that. I appreciated that because she loved me, and so she took it, and she could give it back some too. But she called me. She said, what have you been doing? It was a Saturday morning, and I said, well, I've been busy unlearning the things that I learned in my childhood which was the truth. I was studying the Bible. <laughs> and of course, she, didn't, she wasn't saved then. She didn't take that very well. She said, well, I don't think we did such a bad job in training you and your childhood. She didn't understand. If you didn't train your children in the ways of God, in the wisdom of God, in the word of God, you weren't helping them. And you'll give account for it. So if you've got children that are unsaved, you better be praying for them if you're a parent. Because you're going to give account for them at the judgment seat. No. What a tremendous privilege to know the truth that set us free. Free from dominion. Under the dominion of death and sin and Satan. And this world really is duped. They really are deceived. But you know what? The human heart is wicked enough. We were looking at that at camp last week. The human heart is wicked enough. It doesn't need any help from Satan. Do you know that? Your own heart is, is so wicked. It doesn't need any help from Satan to keep you from God. It is full of self-deception according to the word of God. And until you see that, you're not really broken. Because you're going to still trust some little element of self and that'll keep you from the gospel and from Jesus Christ. And it'll keep you in bondage to sin. The only deliverance is him. But still there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Did you know that? That is a tremendous encouragement you know, some of us have gone door to door, have done public witnessing or street evangelism and different things. And, and you wonder why people aren't responding. The message seems so clear to us now because we have the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are saved. And now it's, it's so clear. We wonder why don't more people get this. But you didn't get it before you were saved. And I didn't either. It took some time, didn't it? It took some breaking of that pride and self-deception. And thank God he did that and persisted in it and pursued us. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Does that answer the world's reaction to Jesus Christ and the gospel? Does it not? That explains it. Because that's exactly what they do. In their pride, in their carnal human reasoning, they think they've got it all figured out. That's what chapter 1 deals with. And they never came to know God. They never came to know salvation. They don't understand what the cross means. They don't understand the message of the cross. And so therefore, what good is all their wisdom doing them? 
It's keeping them from happiness forever with God. (laughs) Do you agree with me? That's something we should lament. All of us have people we know. Whether it be relatives or friends or both. That are trapped in this ungodly thinking. That doesn't mean they don't think. They may be highly intelligent and be able to reason and connect words and sentences and do all kinds of difficult calculations, but they don't know God and they don't know the truth of God and they don't know the message of the cross. And that's essential. It's essential to life. So that's part of what Stephen's dealing with. Coming back to Acts chapter 7. The God of glory, he said, you remember, he starts his message in verse 2 of chapter 7. Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was still in Mesopotamia. He wasn't in the land. The Lord appeared to him. And by the way, they were making such an important emphasis on this place. You remember they said in uh, verse 13 of chapter 6, he spoke blasphemous words against this holy place because the temple was there. This holy place, see. Well, wasn't it a holy place when God appeared to Abraham? It was because God was there. Wasn't it a holy place when God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, and Stephen's going to show that. Because God was there. But the temple in Jerusalem, when Stephen's given this message, is God there? Well, he's he's departing from there, if he isn't already departed after what they did to his son. See? But these Jewish people didn't know that. They thought they were safe with the temple. They had the Holy of Holies there. They had the Ark of the Covenant. If it was returned after the Babylonian captivity, we don't know that. We don't know if the Ark of the Covenant was in the Zerubbabel temple or not. But they had the Holy of Holies and they had the bronze altar and they were offering sacrifices and they had the priesthood and they thought they were following the law. And so therefore they thought they were okay with God. So Stephen rehearses their history, and it was a history of God's faithfulness and Israel's rejection, right? They rejected Joseph. He goes on to talk talk about that. Then he sent Moses, and and they said to him, Or you who made you a ruler and judge over us? I love how Stephen puts it. He says in verse 35, This Moses whom they rejected, this is chapter 7, verse 35, This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be ruler (laughs) and deliverer. See? And they thought they were going to accuse Stephen and defend the law and defend Moses and defend the character of God and defend the temple. Those were the four things they were charging him with in chapter 6. So that brought him to verse 44. Chapter 7. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Now it's interesting. They, they believe that history. They prided themselves in that history. But it's the same word. The word tabernacle in verse 44 is the same word for tabernacle in verse 43. You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphon. So yeah, they were going through the worship of the true living Jehovah Elohim. Through the tabernacle of witness. But they had this other thing going on at the same time. They had Remphon. (laughs) Who is what later he was also called Saturn. Later by the the Romans. And we understand that's that worship of that star Saturn. Which people still worship. And horoscopes and all of those things that go with the zodiac. They were worshipping all of this. But they also had the tabernacle of Moloch, which they sacrificed their children alive to. That was their form of getting rid of children 
when they didn't want them when they were born, see? They made it into a worship service. Heated the metal red hot and put that little infant in the arms of that God and the shriek and the, and the crying that must have gone out, they thought that, that was a song service and that God was pleased with that. What kind of... I'm not talking about pagans... I'm talking about God's people, Israel, were doing this while they had the tabernacle of witness. Both going on. And you say, we would never do that as Christians. <laughs> Be careful. The human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? We may be different ones of us in this room worshiping a false god while we're here worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and not even be aware of it. So it's so important that we be in the word of God with an open heart. That's why we title the message divine revelation. That's the word of God. Are we submitting to it or are we resisting it? Because it's one of the two. When you come to the word of God, whether it be on the Lord's day or your private time, hopefully every day of the week, and you, or is your heart open? Are you willing to submit to what it says no matter what it says? Or are you resisting like what we'll see here they do with Stephen? So he says in verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. By the way, don't miss that. I kind of thought that the Lord communicated the instructions to Moses on how that tabernacle was to be built. Just with verbal instruction. Did you think that when we, we read the book of Exodus? But here we find out that Moses actually saw the true tabernacle in heaven and said, oh, okay, that's what it's supposed to look like. That makes it a lot easier to build, doesn't it? You men that know how to build, or sisters too, some of you sisters can, that, that seeing something in its reality and building in a, a pattern after is very easy, much easier once you've seen the reality, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles. That's when they crossed the Jordan. They brought the tabernacle of witness to Gilgal and then laid it to Shiloh. And then remember it got separated after the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant in Eli's day and so forth. Whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. The days of David would be what we refer to as the United Kingdom. Up till then, they were 12 separate tribes, and they sometimes formed confederacies in fighting against their enemies in the times of the judges, and sometimes they fought each other, like the Benjamite Civil War and so forth. But here, David was able to bring the united monarchy together. It only lasted... 80 years, 40 years with David and 40 years with Solomon. And then it was divided again, wasn't it, after that? And so there, he, Stephen is celebrating that. David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. We read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It was on David's heart. You know what God said about that? It was a good thing that you had that on your heart. I'm not going to let you build it, but it was a good thing that you thought of it. Bill has been known to say, and I agree with him, David gets the credit just for thinking of it, even though Solomon's the one that built it. But David got all the instructions for it. He had the plans drawn up. He got all the materials for it. He wanted to make sure it was done right, even though he wasn't going to be allowed to build it. And he's going to get a lot of the credit for that Solomonic temple. In fact, I like to refer to it more as a Davidic temple than a Solomonic temple because of that. It was David's idea. And what was David thinking? Well, I think David figured that the, he had dispelled all the enemies in the territory of the land of Israel, went all the way to the Euphrates River, which was what God promised to Abraham in the beginning. So from the Negev in the south all the way to the Euphrates River, David had conquered everything. It was all at peace. All 40 years of Solomon's reign were all peace. That's what his name 
Shlomo means peace, right? Shalom. And so David had a desire. We don't need to have this temporary tent that we're going to be, have to move around anymore. Let's build a permanent temple building. God said that was a good thing you had it in your heart. But what was David thinking? In order for that to be true, he was thinking this will be your permanent dwelling place on earth. Did it turn out to be his permanent dwelling place? No. But David didn't in his own mind think that Israel would ever turn against God. Right? They would never turn against God. They would never turn against the word of God. They're God's people. David said, I can't imagine such a thing happening. I'm sure he would never have dreamed not only did they do it once, they've done it twice. And you know what? They're going to do it a third time. In the midpoint of the tribulation period. We know that. You know, it's interesting. This week I found out about a co-worker, a friend, that I haven't seen in a long time, many years, but we worked together a lot in the 90s, and I really respected him. And I found out he, he doesn't believe Jesus is God. Doesn't believe in the deity of Christ anymore. And this third party mutual friend I was talking to said that he talked to him and he said, I still believe the gospel. I just don't believe Jesus is God. And that when he died on that cross, he was just a man. Well, what about you? Because the Bible says, if you don't believe Jesus is God, you're still in your sins. <laughs> you're not saved. You've got to believe he's the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead bodily in order to be saved, including especially when he died on the cross. That's what makes it efficacious. If he's a man, then his blood is tainted with Adam's sin. Romans 5, right? In order for his cross work to be effective, in saving you and me, it has to be holy, untainted blood. And I was, I was terribly saddened by this. I was appalled, shocked. Because this is an intelligent man and he knows the word of God. He, he speaks Hebrew. He taught himself. And, and to come to this place, and he has a wife and he has children... And I don't know what's going to happen to the children, but I know it's going to be horribly confusing for them. Beloved, this could happen to any one of us. If we don't stay in a heart attitude of submission to the truth of God, amen? If you think you're going to go up against this world system without the word of God and the Holy Spirit, you're in for a horrible awakening. And it'll happen, just as it's happening to these people that Stephen's addressing. Stephen is being so loyal to the Lord here. I think he knows what's coming. He knows he's going to be martyred. But he stays, well, like it says at the end of chapter 6, his face was like the face of an angel. I don't think most of us see paintings and even Christian bookstores of angels with all kinds of giddy smiles or whatever. I don't think that's what he had. I think it was sternness, like his face set like a flint, unflinching, standing for the truth of God and confident in what he believed. See, The angels are confident. Of course, they see God all the time. There's no doubt I'm talking about the good ones course so David had this desire to build the temple the house in verse 47 but Solomon built him the house and here that leads into verses 48 to 50 and he comes back to the book of Isaiah the last chapter of Isaiah chapter 66 he says however the most high Remember, he called him the God of glory in 7.2. Here he calls him the Most High. Is he, does he not have an exalted view of God? The Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. Think of it. The Most High 
creator, sustainer of all of this, and you can confine him to a building, to a box. <laughs> and yet that's what these people in his audience were doing. That's He's trying to wake them up, and people still do it. They think they can manipulate God and make him in their image instead of allowing him to make them in his image. See. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne. Think of that. Do you ever meditate on that? Orrin was talking earlier, and I appreciate that, Orrin. I do that too. Look up at the heavens and, and just... In awe of the Lord, I saw the two stars right there at sunset last night too, standing out in the parking lot, and just just praise God. I just I didn't have guitar, I couldn't play it anyway, but I was singing, and hopefully the neighbors didn't mind, making a joyful noise to the Most High. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. <laughs> The footstool is the place where the feet of the king are. That means is under him. You get that? The footstool is under the authority of the king. <laughs> what house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is the place of my rest? See, they were talking about this holy place where the Lord says, what's the place of my rest? I own it all. You're going to confine me to one little box in Jerusalem? He's quoting from their Old Testament. Has my hand not made all these things? <laughs> he made every cell in your body. He made your DNA. Your heart doesn't beat the next beat without him being in charge of it. And your very next breath is in his hand. Has that <laughs> Now I want to do something. As I've said to you before, as we work through the book of Acts, whenever you see an Old Testament quotation, if you can, in your time, in your reading, always try to go back and read the verses in their context. And the verse that, may I say, the Holy Spirit, respectfully, and Stephen leaves out is the next verse, or the next part of verse 2, which to me is significant because... His audience, at least the ones, the Pharisees and the, the chief priests, they would have been educated on Isaiah 66 too. They would have known what the second part of verse 2 is, the, one he, the part he doesn't quote. Turn and look at it with me in your, with your own eyes, if you will. Isaiah 66, last book of the book of Isaiah. Last chapter, I should say, of the book of Isaiah. Verse 1, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? And then notice Stephen quotes the first sentence of verse 2. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But look at the next sentence. Now you may not have thought of this if you've not been reading Isaiah 66 recently, but his audience would have thought of this. What is the type of person that God who is in heaven reigning, what is he looking at and looking for on planet earth? On this one will I look. Three characteristics. What type of person? On him or her, the person who is poor, that is humble, of a contrite spirit, broken, and who trembles at what? At the word of God. <laughs> do you tremble at the word of God? I do. And I hope that never stops. It's not just the newspaper. It's not just a magazine. It's not a theology textbook. Not to say those can't be helpful. I'm not trying to degrade those. But compared to the word of God, the holy scriptures are on a totally different plane. And God says, that's the person he's looking for still. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking those whose heart is fully turned towards him, loyal to him. And his word. Can't be loyal to him without being loyal to his word. 
and can't be loyal to the word without being loyal to him. And then coming back to Acts 7, verse 54, 51. Now don't forget, the Bible tells us Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit in verse 55. So this isn't just Steve, Stephen being aggressive as a preacher. Some of us preachers can get that way. You know, we can get too forceful and not respectful of audience and that kind of a thing. I don't mean political correctness, but we do need to respect. And when we're sharing the word of God one-on-one, -on -one, we need to be respectful of uh, the audience, the person we're speaking with. But look at what Stephen says. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, which was a common expression in the Old Testament, God used it in Deuteronomy of Israel time and again. That is, they're resisting God instead of submitting to him. You do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, which he just rehearsed in his message. He just rehearsed it. I mean, he was selective in the part of history he recorded, but the part of history he gave showed that they were resistant to the word of God all the way through. God was faithful. They were not. Right? You do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so you're doing now. And as a nation, Israel is still doing that. Now, I appreciate your prayers. A week from Tuesday, I'll be standing on promised land ground. Back in the Holy Land, and we're going to have a couple of weeks of study over there. And I have to say, I can't wait. And been doing a lot of preparation for it in the last several weeks. But when you, one of the things, you, when you go over there, you realize. For example, I can't go out and preach Jesus Christ on the street corner in Israel. Without being arrested, at least. And maybe tortured, but at least arrested. And yet, this is the place of the entire planet where God walked. Can you imagine that? God came down to the planet and walked there. We're going to look at a boat that's in a museum, the first century boat that was discovered in 86 by miracle, I would say. And I believe our Lord, it's what the Lord preserved that boat because his hands were used in building it. And it's probably the boat he slept in. It's probably one of Peter's boats, many boats that he had in his fishing business. And God preserved it until 1986. In the sand, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, a piece of it was sticking up out of the sand because they'd been through a drought. <laughs> the water level was low, and the people walking, they saw it. So Stephen says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Ouch! He's right, but ouch, right? Which are the prophets? The answer is they persecuted all of them in one way or another. Which of the prophets did, did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, including Isaiah, whom they, he just quoted from. They sought him in two. Of whom you now have become, you have become the betrayers and murderers. Come right to it. He's fearless. He's fearless. And that's why I think that the face of an angel, that's the look he had. He's representing God. He knows God is in him, speaking through him. And he's the Lord's servant. And he has full confidence. And beloved, if you are full of the Holy Spirit, that'll be true of you too. So you want to be full of the Holy Spirit when you're sharing the gospel, especially with the wicked, right? So you can stand strong, unwavering, not shaking, not doubting, standing strong. I believe what this is. This is the word of God, and I'm going to proclaim it unwaveringly, not holding back. He didn't hold back, did he? He's a hero, and he became Paul's hero. Paul never forgot this. Who had received the law, note this, 
gives him credit for receiving the law. He talked about Mount Sinai and how Moses got the law. In his message, you received the law by the direction of angels. But she didn't keep it. <laughs> we used to have a family picture sitting on this couch. I still have the couch at my house. It's a couch that goes back to 1962. <laughs> but here's this couch, beautiful French provincial design couch with a coffee table in front of it with a big Bible, one of those ones with all the pictures in it, big Bible in front of it. And we were all looking at it as a family, and I said, you know, if that Bible had been in us instead of sitting on that coffee table, things would have been a lot different in our family. I said that after I was saved. I had illumination then. And it's true. All it was was a relic. I was taught at Jesuit high school to doubt it, to treat it like another literature book. That's what the Jesuits taught me, and at Loyola. Interesting book, nice book of history, good poetry. Beloved, this is the word of God. It's not just another literature book. If it was just another literature book, if that's what you thought, no wonder you're not reading it every day. Because <laughs> I don't read Chaucer or Wordsworth every day. They're just literature books. This is the word of God. It's alive. You received the law, but you didn't keep it. I mean, what good is it to have the Bible if you're not reading it, right? You heard of the Chinese missionary that said that uh, he was visiting in China and these people only have pages, some of them. Uh, this was back in the late 90s. They've been, they were allowed to print Bibles in the early 2000s, but I understand the government's clamping down on that again in this kind of return to persecuting Christians. So some of them just had pages of the Bible and they asked him, so you've got the Bible, the whole word of God in your own language? How often do you read it? They, the Chinese young believer asked him. He said, well, I, once in a while, I, I don't, I'm busy, you know. He said, you have the word of God and you don't read it? We're, ju we're glad just to have pages of it. You've got the whole thing. Think about it, beloved. But read it with an open heart. And that leads to verses 54 to 60. So I, I think you agree with me, God's greatness especially in that quotation from Isaiah in verse 49 and 50, God's greatness has been affirmed. And here we see the lament, part two of what I'm talking about, human resistance. But along with human resistance in verses 54 to 60, because Luke, the writer, and it's a dynamic the Holy Spirit likes to do, we call it, the technical word is interchange. Moving back and forth between one person and another or one event and another. And it excites our brains, if you're not aware of it, when you're reading something that when the literary device of interchange is used, it keeps us engaged in the story. And that's what he's doing here. So he'll, he'll look at Stephen and he'll look at the audience. And he'll come back to Stephen and the audience. The audience is resisting. Stephen is totally submissive. Verse 54, when they, the audience, heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That is, they were convicted. By whom? By their own intelligence? No, by the Holy Spirit. We just read in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. And so only the Holy Spirit is enables And so they're convicted. But what do they do? Do they bow before God and seek to be saved? They gnashed at him with their teeth. Mm. Now, maybe none of us has ever been that angry to actually gnash your teeth, rub your teeth together like this. But it's a form of anger that's probably usually satanic inspired. In other words, it's illogical. I've, known, I've been around people that have gotten to that, that kind of angry. You don't want to be around them. You don't want to be driving next to them on the highway either. 
Give them room. Let them go. They're probably armed. And who knows what they'll do in this day and age in which we live, right? But he, switching back to Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, as he was through the whole message, gazed into what? He gazed into heaven. God enabled this. Now, he doesn't do this for every martyr. And if you are a martyr for the Lord, that's part of your calling. Could be. He might give you this, but don't demand it from him, right? But to me, this is awesome. I know that there are stories in talking to Christians, I'm talking about believers now who have died, including I happen to be right there at the time when I saw the breath and the spirit leave my mom's body, which was something I asked the Lord to be there for that and was able to be there for her at that particular moment. But we don't know how much they see and understand at that moment, but you hear story. But I think God gives them a lot more comfort and assurance, and maybe they're not even feeling the pain. We don't know, because they can't tell us. We don't know if they're looking into the face of the Lord Jesus, but it sure looked like Mom was seeing him. <laughs> she was totally ready. She wasn't running away. She had been early in her life. Being full of the Holy, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and who? Who? Is he just a man? He saw Jesus and what was he doing? Standing at the right hand of God. Now the Bible tells us that he's seated at the right hand of God, but he stood up. Why would he be standing? I think to receive Stephen. And approval, well done. You're doing exactly what I've got you there for. And so Stephen speaks out. He's totally enraptured by the moment, I'm sure, by now. Look! I see the heavens open. And notice he, he doesn't say Jesus. He changes. And I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's not accidental. And some of us will say, well, yeah, the Son of Man, that's a title that we see of the Lord in the Gospels. But the reason that is used, I want you to turn back and see it with your own eyes. Go back to Daniel chapter 7, because in that vision in Daniel, this is what Stephen's referring to. And I believe this is what the gospel writers are referring to. By calling Jesus a son of man, they aren't just emphasizing that he's both God and man. They're emphasizing this. Verse 13, Daniel 7. I was watching in the night visions and beholding one like whom? The son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord. He came to the ancient of days. That's the father. And they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That's what makes him a king. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is how long? Everlasting, eternal, which shall not pass away. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Unlike the four kingdoms listed earlier in Daniel 7, that each one has been destroyed. His is eternal. From sea to shining sea, he shall reign on planet earth. And we're going to reign with him. <laughs> you see what the... now. Again, maybe to a Christian audience in the 21st century, son of man may not hit, but with the audience of these Jewish people, they knew what Daniel 7, 13 and 14 taught. And when he says Jesus is the son of man, he's saying that Jesus is God and Messiah. And he's standing at the right hand of God Daniel 7 says he's coming back. That was his, the second advent, right? That hasn't happened yet. He's still at the Father's right hand. Bless you, Lord. And you're coming to earth to reign forever. And I can't wait. How about you? And so what's their response? I'm so glad 
I'm so glad I don't see anyone with a stone in their hands throw, to throw at me here in this room. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit has touched your heart and you are receiving this with a smile. But they weren't receiving it with a smile, were they? Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ratted him with one accord. Can you imagine? So they're going like this and they're running at him with their hands on their ears like that. Does that not look satanic? It might, well, it would have looked ridiculous too, but <laughs> it would have looked ridiculous, but they, they, we don't want to hear another word and we're going to come at you. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Shaul, <laughs> Saul, Paul the Apostle. Now, to me, in honor of Stephen, God has preserved even all these years the gate where they dragged him out of and stoned him. Today, to this day, is still called St. Stephen's Gate. In unbelieving national Israel, God says, you're still going to honor my first martyr. It's also called the Lion Gate because in the Turkish wall, when the Ottoman Turks built it, they put a lion in the stonework on either side of the gate. But it's also referred to as St. Stephen's Gate. And inside that gate, just to the right, about a block in, is St. Anne's Church where the Pool of Bethesda is, which has been excavated. And it's exactly like it was in the first century with water still in it. Fascinating. And the Via Della Rosa goes on from there. It's all there. They cast him out of the city, stoned him. And they, as they stoned Stephen, verse 59, what was he doing? Was he agonizing in pain? Was he worried or anxious? I love this. And I believe God can do this for any of his children. You and me included. Because even for us, getting close to death's door, we get a little agitated, maybe. I mean, we're, we have faith. But it's always the biggest test of faith is when you're right at death's door. It's always a great test. Why do we fight it so much? Let's go. <laughs> you know? We'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to live here another couple of days. Let's go. Sometimes it's time to, sometimes it's the Lord wants us to stay. He's got more of our mission to finish. I understand. Not picking on anybody. But it's going to be great. So Stephen, as he was calling on the Lord... And notice what he calls him, Lord Jesus. So he's called him Jesus, called him Son of Man, and now he calls him Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Isn't that a great? John Owen the Puritan, some of you may not like him because he was the chaplain to Oliver Cromwell. My mom didn't, we were Irish, so, you know, and Cromwell was not a prominent word in, in their history because of all the Irish that he killed. And Owen was his chaplain and encouraging him to do, not necessarily to kill people, but, but that's what I understand on his deathbed. Lord, receive my spirit. I release you. I trust you. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. And now you notice he's imitating his Savior, isn't he? Lord, do not charge them with this sin. It was a sin because they were committing murder. He was innocent and they didn't even give him a trial. <laughs> they violated all kinds of ethical codes in their code book as well as the law. I say code book because they added to the law. And when he had said this, he died. Is that what it says? <laughs> I love it. He fell asleep. <laughs> That's what it is for a believer. Paul says the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 4, right? 
Not all of us shall sleep, but we shall all be transformed at the rapture. I told you I'd show you from the Bible, and so turn over a few pages to chapter 22, because in chapter 22, now we have really God's last message from the apostles to national Israel. And guess who's in this message? Paul. <laughs> Paul made his determined, the last several chapters of the book of Acts, as we'll see, giving you a little window ahead, Paul had this determination to get back to Jerusalem, to his people, and give the gospel one more time. And you remember, as he goes, he gets warnings from different, one, different believers. Don't go. You're going to die. Don't go. And he says, I, if I die, I die. I'm paraphrasing. I'm going. The Lord's put this on my heart to do this. And, and he died for me. I'm willing to do this for him. And you remember, Luke just tells us it was his desire when he was in, I've forgotten, Corinth or Ephesus, I think it was Ephesus, to get there by Pentecost. And then he, Luke doesn't tell us he got there by Pentecost, but he gives the dates, starting from Passover. And Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. And guess what? He made it. <laughs> he got there by Pentecost, and he tries to give the, a message to the people, and they mob him. That's in chapter 21. And he hasn't done anything wrong. And guess what? This is, he's just rehearsing what Stephen So as Paul was led in verse 37 of chapter 21, Paul was being led into the barracks, the Antonia fortress. He said to the commander, may I speak to you? And he said, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and so forth? And God and Paul says, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak. But when he addresses the people in verse 1 of chapter 22, he changes from Greek to what language? <laughs> he wants them to hear him. He's going to speak in Hebrew. And when they heard, they spoke to them in the Hebrew language. They kept all the more silent. And he began to give his story of his conversion. And moving down in the story, it happened, verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him, the Lord, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. This is what happened after Paul's conversion. And notice what Paul says. So I said, he's talking back and forth to the Lord. So I said, Lord... They know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And this is the verse, verse 20. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. All these years later, it's still fresh in Paul's mind as the day it happened. I think he never forgot the expression on Stephen's face and the words Stephen said. And the Lord said, get out. <laughs> I'm going to send you from here to the Gentiles. And as soon as he mentioned the word Gentiles, they, they listened to him. Luke tells, until that word, and then stirred up a big riot and so forth. Stephen was loyal. The impact one testimony can have on another. I don't know if Stephen knew Paul was in the audience, but God did. I'm going to close with three questions. Are you one of these? Are you one of those that were taking up stones to stone Stephen because of resistance to the word of God? Are you joining with him in his prayer and submitting to the word of God? It's a good application for us, isn't it? I speak to myself too. Secondly, I want to add this. This isn't something you answer right now, but maybe this week in your time with the Lord, speaking to myself too, ask God to show you. Am I resisting you, Lord, in any way in my life right now? That's submission, right? That's the prayer of David at the end of Psalm 139. Where can I go from your presence? And he says, search me, O Lord, 
and test my anxious thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is, show me the right way, but you've got to show me where I'm departing from it so that I can get back on it. That is a prayer of humble submission. That's King David. Whatever you want to say about King David, I look at those verses and that's way short of spirituality that we see amongst us today, I think. King David. And then thirdly, this is an encouragement or admonition. Let's be magnifying the Lord. Let's be thinking of creative new ways to do it, maybe. But let's be magnifying the Lord. Let's just start with this week. Magnify the Lord, magnify the word, magnify, magnify the gospel every day this week. I said, well, we planned on doing it Thursday. And we do too. I'll be with Christians, Lord willing, in Houston, and we're going to be doing it, I'm sure. But I mean, every day, when there aren't any Christians around to encourage us. Right? Isn't he worthy of that? It'll lift your soul to heights and give you strength for whatever it is you're dealing with. And it'll please him. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of Stephen and for the example that he gives us, Lord. And we pray that each one of us would learn to apply these things in our own lives. This isn't just a lesson on history. May it not be that. It is that, but it's so much more, Lord. And to see how faithful you are standing there ready to receive him, that's what's ahead for us. We thank you for this salvation so rich and free, Lord. There's no one like you. You really are awesome. Be with us as we part. Get us all home safely. We're thankful for those that are traveling and pray for journeying mercies for each of them. Those that some may be sick. Pray for grieving for uh, Debbie Romero and her sisters and her family. Pray for JC as he's going through these treatments. Others too. So we thank you, O Lord, and we bring these things before you in the Lord Jesus' worthy name.